Let the Joint Assembly please come to order. On behalf of those elected to serve you, we welcome you to your Mississippi State Capitol and to this historic chamber. In a moment, our Lieutenant Governor will be introducing you to our, our Governor for his annual State of the State message. I believe most of us would agree, possibly the most important one we've heard in many years. Certainly, I believe the most important one that I've heard in my 31 years to serve in this chamber. As we work together during these very difficult times, let us be mindful that our troubles are small compared to our brothers and sisters in Haiti. On behalf of the Mississippi House of Representatives, we pledge to work with our colleagues in the Senate and our governor not only to extend our hand to our neighbors, but to work together to meet our responsibilities for the citizens of Mississippi. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Lieutenant Governor, Speaker, would like to ask that the committee composed of Representatives Mac Huddleston, Bryant Clark, Margaret Rogers, and Senators Vidette Carmichael, Gray Tollison, and Eric Powell to escort Governor Haley Barber and his wife Marsha to the Speaker's stand. Now I present to you our Lieutenant Governor, the Honorable Phil Bryan, who will preside over the Joint Assembly. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, good evening. It is so wonderful to be back in the House of Representatives. I'd like you to join me in recognizing some very important people, and we will begin with one of my dear friends, a man that I served with when I first came to this chamber in 1992, a man who has been here as a servant for 31 years. He's the former education chairman, former transportation chairman, former ways and means chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the Speaker of the Mississippi House, the Honorable Billy McCoy. At the speaker's right hand sits this man, former House Transportation Chairman and now the House Speaker Pro Tem, the Honorable J.P. Compretta. A man that I could not do without, who provides great leadership in the Mississippi Senate, also the former Senate Transportation Chairman and now the President Pro Tem of the Mississippi Senate, the Honorable Billy Hughes. Now I'd like to introduce our statewide elected officials, the Honorable Secretary of State Delbert Hoseman. Mr. Secretary. Uh, Attorney General Jim Hood. Ms. General Hood could not be with us. State Treasurer Tate Reeves. State Auditor Stacy Pickering. Mississippi's Commissioner of Insurance Mike Cheney. Our longtime Commissioner of Agriculture and Commerce, the Honorable Lester Spell. 
Now, please welcome with me the Mississippi Supreme Court. I would ask you to please hold your applause until all of the justices have been introduced. Chief Justice William Waller, Jr. Presiding Justice George C. Carlton, Jr. Presiding Justice James E. Graves. Justice Jess H. Dickerson. Justice Michael Randolph, who he could not be with us tonight. Justice Ann H. Lamar. Justice Jim Kitchens. Justice David H. Chandler. Justice Randy Pierce. Let's please give them a hand. Help me welcome our State Court of Appeals. And again, please hold your applause until all the judges have been introduced. Chief Judge Leslie King. Chief, I know a House member. <laughs> Presiding Judge Joseph Lee, Joe Lee. Presiding Judge William H. Myers, who could not be with us today. Judge Tyree Irving don't think could attend with either. Judge Kenneth Griffiths, Jr. Judge Donna Barnes. Judge David M. Ishi. Judge Larry E. Roberts. Judge Virginia Carlton. <laughs> and Judge Jimmy Maxwell. Let's give these judges a hand. Our Public Service Commissioner for the State of Mississippi, Northern District Public Service Commissioner Brandon Presley. Commissioner Presley, is he in the house? Central District Public Service Commissioner Lynn Posey. Southern District Public Service Commissioner Leonard Bentz. Let's give them all a hand. Obviously very busy tonight. And now our transportation commissioners, please hold your applause until all have been introduced. Northern District Transportation Commissioner Bill Miner. Central District Transportation Commissioner the Honorable Dick Hall. Southern District Transportation Commissioner the Honorable Wayne Brown. Let's give them a hand. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce someone who continues to work for the betterment of all Mississippians, traveling the state, promoting healthier lifestyles and improving education. A lady who not only loves the people of this great state, but loves her family deeply. A proud mother and believe it or not, even a prouder grandmother with the addition of their fourth grandchild just this week, ladies and gentlemen, the great first lady of this state, Ms. Marsha Barber. First Lady here. Now I have the distinct honor and privilege of introducing a man who has guided us through some tough economic times. Even during these hardships, he has been a beacon of hope for a better Mississippi. He is a strong leader in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. We now look forward to working beside him as he moves through this financial storm we find ourselves in today. With the recent announcement of a $300 million manufacturing facility with more than 500 new jobs in the Mississippi Delta, now more than ever, we look to his leadership as we continue on this journey together. Ladies and gentlemen, a leader that we can be proud of Please help me welcome the governor of the state of Mississippi, the Honorable Haley Reeves Barber.
Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Mr. Speaker, Governor Bryant, members of the legislature, distinguished guests, and fellow Mississippians, for the seventh time I'm honored to come before you to share my view of the state of our state. I appreciate your inviting me, and I want to say that I appreciate Mississippi Public Broadcasting and its presenters for tele telecasting tonight's speech live again for the seventh time. Now, welcome back to all you legislators who had to go home early the last two weeks during the icy cold weather and the water system problems. We're glad you all made it back to Jackson safe and sound, but I got to tell you, this global warming about to freeze me to death. <laughs> know that I genuinely appreciate your warm welcome, Marsha. I'm biased, but I promise you, I could never have a stronger, better first lady who loves our state and works hard for it. And a little tidbit, Phil kind of ratted on me. While Marcia is still a beautiful college girl I met in 1968 to me, last week, by God's grace, she did become a grandmother again for the fourth time. I had actually written that to say she's still a chick to me. My staff wouldn't stand for it, so. What'd you say? Oh, what you <laughs> See, I could have got away with it. At the beginning of my speech, I want to recognize Major General Bill Freeman, our Adjutant General. I recognize General Freeman as a way to honor and praise the men and women of the Mississippi National Guard. My, <clears throat> today, we have nearly 4,000 guardsmen and women in Iraq and Afghanistan fighting for our freedom in the war on terror. For many, including our largest guard unit, the 155th Brigade Combat Team, this is the second tour. For some others, even more. Marsha and I ask you for your prayers as well as your praise for these soldiers and airmen and for their families. Additionally, I have to tell you, our Air Guard is flying missions to the combat zone every week. And last week, a Mississippi Air National Guard C-17 was among the first planes to deliver life-saving relief surprise into Port-au-Prince for the people of Haiti. Remembering how good people were to us after Katrina, we continue and will continue to do everything we can to help the people of Haiti. And we should all remember them in our prayers too. Marsha joins me in thanking you for what Speaker McCoy called the best first day of a legislature in the 31 years he's been a member. I'm grateful to the Lieutenant Governor and the Speaker to Chairman Watson and Kirby and all the other leadership for passing the package to bring Schultz GmbH to Tunica County, where this German company will invest $300 million and employ 500 people in manufacturing of advanced steel products for the energy industry. Like General Electric in Batesville and ATK in Tishomingo County, both of which recently announced expansions and increased their employment. Schultz manufactures advanced products made with advanced materials using advanced technologies and processes. Of course, this is just what we want more of because it puts Mississippi workers on the front lines of innovative technologies and advanced manufacturing. And I want to say to you, I appreciate you for recognizing that during this global recession, when Mississippi competes for a project like Schultz, 
which was sought by about 300 counties nationwide. And MDA and our local leaders succeed in the competition. It behooves us all to move quickly and decisively, which you did, and I'm grateful for it. Give yourselves a hand. On the same day as Schultz, you revised and reauthorized the Workforce Enhancement Training Fund. I congratulate you again and thank Chairman Watson, Strauder, and Kirby. Originally passed in 2005, this so-called WET Fund provides more than $20 million a year to our community colleges for workforce development and job training. Under a program created by the State Workforce Investment Board and the Department of Employment Security that features strong accountability and has produced terrific results. Those who have been trained with wet fund dollars earn $4,300 a year more than before their training. Some think workforce training is something we do for employers attract industries and jobs, and that's true, but that's only a small part of it. I believe workforce development and skills training are things we owe our working people to help them increase their wages and get better benefits. Sometimes more skills leads to new, higher paying jobs, but most of the time, this training is necessary to keep the current job or to get a promotion at the current workplace, and it works. Although the 2009 numbers aren't in yet, from 2004 through 2008, per capita income in Mississippi went up 27%, one of the largest increases in the country. And a lot of that came from replacing low-skilled, low-wage jobs with higher skilled, better paying jobs. Your passage of the wet fund authorization, reauthorization, means that we'll be able to keep doing more of that, which lets American Eurocopter at Columbus add 64 jobs and expand to build every year 60 more light utility helicopters for the Army. It complements our shipbuilding academy to help find new workers and upgrade the skills of current workers for our shipbuilders on the coast and for our energy industry. And let me just say about our energy industry, it is both growing and critical to Mississippi's future. Mississippi Power's $2.2 billion Kemper County electricity plant will be a national pace setter. It'll take Mississippi lignite coal convert it to synthetic gas, burn it to generate electricity, and then capture the carbon dioxide and sell it for use in enhanced oil recovery. That gives value to this indigenous local lignite coal. It provides many jobs in the construction phase. It gives Mississippi Power's customers stable, affordable, baseload electric rates for decades to come and it'll be the first commercial scale example of carbon capture and sequestration in the United States. It's a home run for Mississippi. <laughs> Entergy has announced a $510 million expansion of its Grand Gulf One nuclear facility. It'll increase the plant's output by some 13%, again, providing more stable, low-cost baseload power to customers while providing lots of good jobs and generating more taxes. And nuclear, the big green clean energy machine, emits no greenhouse gases. South Mississippi Electric Power is in the middle of a $500 million expansion series of upgrades to improve service for our state's Rural Electric Power Association members. Chevron in Pascagoula is completing several hundred million dollars of upgrades that have increased the output 
of refined gasoline product at the refinery by 10% while using no more crude oil. Next to Chevron, Gulf LNG is approaching completion of its $1.1 billion liquefied natural gas terminal in, in Jackson County. It'll in further, it will further enhance our state's standing as a reliable energy state. In fact, Mississippi is one of the few states in the country where petroleum production has actually gone up over the last several years. Companies like Denberry Resources, which has invested $1.5 billion in tertiary recovery projects using CO2, and TELUS, our largest independent producer, continue to use advanced technologies to produce Mississippi oil and gas for America. Ergon and Bungie's facility at Vicksburg supplies 60 million gallons of ethanol a year. And Scott Petroleum has a fully operational biodiesel plant in Washington County. There's much more to come. And for important reasons, I will tell you that in the years to come, 10 or 15 years from now, companies, when they ask about energy, are not going to ask, what does it cost? They're going to ask, can we get it? That's why I'm proud that you have helped Rentec, Rentec, which is to build a $3 billion plus dollar coal to liquid fuels plants in Natchez. In mid-December, Rentec announced an agreement as a prelude to its provision of certified jet fuel. Certified jet fuel made from coal and produced in Adams County, Mississippi to 13 domestic and international passenger and cargo air carriers. Also, Mississippi gasification has been selected by the United States Department of Energy for a $1.7 billion guaranteed loan to build a synthetic natural gas plant at Moss Point. This plant will buy pet coke, a low-grade byproduct of the refining process, and convert it into synthetic gas. This will provide a stable price for natural gas which all of you know has seen its price extremely volatile in recent years. And the plan will create a much higher use for our pet coke, keeping that energy in Mississippi. Interchem, a Canadian company, just received a $50 million federal grant to build a waste to energy facility in Pontotoc using municipal and other ways to generate electricity. And Blue Fire Ethanol, a company based in California, been awarded $88 million in grants to build a $300 million cellulosic et ethanol biorefinery in Fulton using wood waste. These are two of only 19 renewable energy projects in the entire United States that receive grant awards from the United States Department of Energy. Experts confirm that Mississippi is a prime focus in the biofuels energy industry because of our large supply of wood products and our proven capacity to grow feedstock crops for cellulosic ethanol and similar fuels. I will tell you, as long as I am governor of Mississippi, Mississippi will have an energy policy. And our policy is more affordable American energy. That's what our country needs. Both improving the skills of our workforce and being a reliable energy state are crucial to job creation in Mississippi now and for many years to come. When Toyota or General Electric talks about why it chose our state, the first thing cited is the quality of the workforce. It's number one. We have to make sure that we have enough high quality skilled workers who can be trained for the next expansion or the next 10 new industries. Our workforce has gained tremendous respect nationally and internationally over the last few years. 
And it is incumbent upon us to keep the pipeline filled with good workers, ready to be trained for job-specific skills. We must never let that pipeline of skilled workers run out or be perceived as running out. I spent the first part of my speech tonight talking about job creation because Mississippi families know job creation is the most important thing needed to help them, their businesses, and our state. More people working means more income for those families who are personally hit by this global recession. It means more revenue for our small and middle class businesses who are the backbone of our economy and of the nation's economy too. And here at state government, job creation means more taxpayers with more taxable income. Indeed, most of the difficult budget problems facing us this session, and for another year or two after that, I'm afraid to tell you, directly result from job losses and the, recess the recession that led to them. So I hope you think it's appropriate that I would speak to you first about job creation, my top priority. And I believe it should also be the top priority of our country as well. Still, we can't be together tonight on this occasion early in the 2010 legislative session without focusing on the difficult fiscal challenges we face together. I emphasize together because it will be hard enough to resolve our budget dilemma if we do work together. We may not agree on everything and don't have to. We do have to be honest with each other and our constituents about the facts, the situations we face, and honest about the options we have. As I have said many times over the last several weeks, I have felt like the leadership, bicameral and bipartisan, recognizes we have tough choices and are open to new ideas. I appreciate that. Our citizens need it. And I want to say I am committed to working with you. We all know we must have a balanced budget. And it appears to me that there's no appetite for tax increases. I agree. I don't have any tax appetite for tax increases. In a recession when our businesses and families are hard pressed and their incomes are down, the last thing we should do is further reduce their incomes by raising taxes. The Joint Legislative Budget Committee's budget recommendation called for record savings and left no sec sacred cows untouched. While the cuts were not quite the same as those in my budget recommendation, the committee made plain that in fiscal year 2011, it can't be business as usual with state spending. And I applaud the Legislative Budget Committee. I applaud you that are in this room and those that are not present tonight. And I pledge to work with you and the LBO staff to fashion the best budget we can that lives within our means. Of course, we don't agree on everything and shouldn't be expected to when we're talking about five and a half billion dollars of spending. I strongly believe the state's rainy day fund, the working cash stabilization fund, must last at least three more years, and that only a third of the balance, or $78 million a year, should be appropriated this session for FY11. I feel that way even more strongly uh, because, as you were advised by State Treasurer Tate Reeves, our annual tobacco payment went down by $10 million 
compared to last year. And of course, both the LBR and my budget will have to be adjusted down to show that and other reductions in available revenue. I consider one of the worst mistakes that can be made at a time like this would be the excessive use of one-time money. And of course, the appropriations for the year we're in right now, fiscal year 10, and those for next year do and will contain huge amounts of federal stimulus money that the following fiscal year will go away. That is one-time money because it'll evaporate under current federal law. About $150 million of that stimulus money is scheduled to be gone by December 31st, and about twice as much, or $350 million, on June 30th of next year. We have to carefully work around these funds, using them productively, but knowing and planning how to budget and spend when these funds are gone, as they will be. These enormous amounts of disappearing federal funds mean fiscal year 2012, the budget you must deal with in the next legislative session, the legislative session during the election year, may be even tougher than this one. Again, because of all this, I urge you to be prudent and conservative, to err on the side of less spending, lest you make next year even worse. My budget and the LBR, the legislative budget recommendation, have some differences in the amount of money we'll have available to appropriate. And that was even the case before we learned of the $10 million decline in the tobacco payment. For one thing, the Legislative Budget Committee recommends spending down $35 million from the Tobacco Trust Fund. Now, for our public viewers, this is separate from the money spent from the annual payment, which we get every year, that the State Treasurer told us has actually gone down. This $35 million in the legislative budget recommendation would actually be taken from the balance of the existing trust fund. Since I've been governor, it's become clear to me that this trust fund, the health care trust fund as it's officially known, is not and never will be held in trust in the true sense of the word. It'll never build up since the interest to earnings now are not large enough to be material in future budgets. So while I didn't propose it, if it's the will of the legislature, I will agree to spending down the balance of the existing fund so long as it's done on a schedule of equal payments over a period of at least four years. On the other hand, I don't support the idea of a tax amnesty. First of all, the overwhelming majority of Mississippians faithfully pay their taxes every year. Those good taxpayers deserve for us to make every effort to collect the taxes that are owed by people or companies that aren't paying like they're supposed to. The state had a tax amnesty in 2004. It produced about $9 million in extra revenue. Just, just back in 2004, and I want to suggest to you, if we have a tax amnesty every four, five, or six years, as is proposed by the legislative budget recommendation, tax cheating will get worse because some people will figure they can beat the system by not paying and they can not get caught before the next tax amnesty. I don't. My budget calls for no tax amnesty but instead for a small increase in the tax commission budget for collecting unpaid taxes owed to the state of Mississippi. And that should produce as much money every year as a tax amnesty would produce just once. Let's don't undermine tax compliance or be unfaithful to faithful taxpayers. Let's collect the taxes our state's already owed. There's a proposal in the LBR to raid the Hurricane Disaster Reserve Fund. 
this fund is there to pay matching funds that we owe the federal government for $400 million of hazard mitigation expenses made in South Mississippi. For three years, we have tried to get FEMA to accept in-kind payment of the nearly $100 million we owe them. We think that's right. We think we deserve it. But they haven't agreed to give us in-kind treatment. So spending any of the existing hurricane disaster reserve for any other purpose than this federal match would be unacceptable because we have to have this money to pay them the nearly $100 million that we owe them today. When we look at state revenue for the first six months of the year, of the current fiscal year, July through December of 2009. That revenue was 8.1% below the level on which this year's budget was based. Since the decline steepened to December, I see no reason to expect any improvement in revenue for fiscal year 2010, the fiscal year we're in right now. If you figure revenue gets no worse this year, but stays at minus 8.1% for the rest of the fiscal year, the shortfall in revenue for the general fund and equivalents will be about $437 million for the entire year. Just a few months ago, we estimated the shortfall would only be $371 million. But an 8.1% shortfall, which is what we had the first six months, would be $437 million. And I will have to say to you, I fear it may be worse than that. For the budget year you will pass this session, the budget for fiscal year 2011 that begins July 1, the Revenue Estimating Committee and the Legislative Budget Committee will give you revised figures in March or so, so you'll have updated information on expected tax collections before you're asked to vote on the FY11 budget. However, for this fiscal year, 2010, spending reductions must be made now to get our budget back into balance. By state law, the governor is required to make cuts to appropriated spending sufficient to align spending with actual revenue. You may recall that I cut about $226 million in state spending last fall. Another $211 million must be cut based on an 8.1% revenue shortfall. The Attorney General has issued an opinion that says only debt service is exempt from the current law that limits the governor's discretion in spending cuts. That law says the governor can cut any department, agency, or line by up to 5%, but can't cut any account by more than 5% until every department and agency has been cut by 5%, except for debt service. Then the law goes on to say any cuts above 5% must be the same for every department and agency with no exemption except debt service. I've asked you to change that law to allow the governor the flexibility to cut departments and agencies by up to 10%. The Senate has passed such a bill, though it limits the governor's discretion to just this year ending at sine die, which is fine with me. I will suggest that you're probably going to want to give the governor this flexibility again next year for the same reasons, but there's no reason to have to deal with that now. Because departments and agencies, especially education, need to know as soon as possible what size cuts they have to make, I ask and urge the House to please pass this 10% flexibility bill. If not, every department and agency will be cut about 8.1%, including special 
as well as general funds. As an example of why the 10% bill with flexibility is, criti is critically needed, let me refer you to the corrections budget for our prison system. An 8.1% cut for corrections would equal $26 million. To make such a cut for the rest of this fiscal year would require the corrections department to let 3,400 to 4,000 prisoners out of prison in short order. This would be 3,400 or 4,000 convicts who are not approved for parole, have not gone through any pre-release preparation or training, and for whom there are very, very few jobs in Mississippi today. Now, I can't believe anybody that's watching this speech on television or hearing it on the radio would vote to turn loose 3,400 to 4,000 convicts, to turn them loose onto the public and onto civil society. That is the most glaring reason that the Senate bill needs to be passed. Further, this 10% bill would allow smaller cuts in MAEP and K through 12 than under the current law, as I could use the little discretion I would have to that end. Again, experience shows the managers and directors of departments and agencies and schools need to know this week, at the latest, the amounts of their reduction so they can make the changes required to achieve that amount of savings. And it's imperative that agencies receive lump sum appropriations and be taken out from under the state personnel board in order to effectively manage the necessary cuts for the current fiscal year and for FY11. None of this would be easy, but every day that goes by makes it even more difficult. Let me close on this subject by saying current law would not produce an acceptable answer in implementing the required budget cuts to have a balanced budget. But the only choices are current law, the Senate bill, or for the legislature to make the cuts. If the legislature wants to enact the needed 200 plus million dollars in cuts, that's fine with me. But my experience is that would take a long time when time is what our schools, departments, and agencies don't have. This is why it seems the only reasonable way forward is the 10% flexibility bill passed by the Senate. We have some really difficult budget problems. And there's no fun talking about them in a speech. However, we all know our job is to face the facts and deal with the facts the best way we know how. And I have to tell you, I believe next year's budget will be just as hard, if not harder, because of all that federal stimulus money that will be gone. All that said, let me close by telling you, despite our budget problems, I'm bullish about what's around the corner for our state. I'm optimistic soon Mississippi will be leading the country out of this recession. This global recession, tough as it is, strikes me as just a break in the economic momentum our state had to the middle of 2008. Knocked us, it knocked us back, but didn't knock us down. The fact that state revenue is, la is a lagging economic indicator that recovers more slowly than the real economy, plus the hundreds of millions of dollars of federal stimulus money that will disappear over the next year or so, combined to mean the state budget won't get well until long after Mississippi's real economy is growing again and strongly. While you state officials and I'll still be wrestling with these nasty budget problems as, as long as I'm around as governor. I predict our people 
our businesses, Mississippi's real economy, will see a lot of good things happening this year and next. You know, this is the day that we celebrate Reverend Martin Luther King's birthday. He had a dream about America and our people. His I Have a Dream speech is one of the most famous and most quoted speeches in the English language. Our little chat tonight will never be viewed in that league, but I would suggest to you that we should all have a dream about Mississippi's future. I believe a time is fast approaching when mothers and grandmothers in our state will see their children and grandchildren staying in Mississippi to make their careers and their futures because Mississippi will be the best place, the place that offers the best opportunities to be productive, have a successful career, and a great quality of life for their families. And that day is not far off. 2010 is the year when we will lead America out of this recession. The year when we'll pick up where we left off before the recession, sidetracked our growing economy and rising incomes. We can and will outperform the national economy. We were doing it before this global recession and we'll be doing it again. So my advice to you as we close is Mississippi. Believe in it. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Governor Barber. All that are here as this joint assembly comes to a close, I would like to recognize the gentleman from Jackson, the Honorable Billy Broomfield, to dissolve this joint session. Mr. Broomfield. Lieutenant Governor Bryan, I move this joint session be now dissolved. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the motion from the gentleman from Jackson. The joint assembly be now dissolved. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. This joint assembly is now dissolved.